Well, I promised I would never, ever, ever do one of these again. And yet, sometimes life hits you like a blunt force fucking injury. Welcome to Let's Talk About That For Me with Mr. Pope. All right, well, we can get the show started now. Looks like this is the great return and relaunching of Mr. Pope's famous podcast, Podcast. Let's talk about that for a minute. An hour-long show where your host, your wonderful, multi-talented, has all the goods, never been turned down in his life for any reason or purpose. That's right, his unholy mess, Mr. Pope, is back and swinging. I have been, against all odds, resisting doing another show. Obviously, I hope you're all safe during this coronavirus, during this COVID. Uh, the last show that I did was about, um, you know, it was called The Outbreak Addiction. Ad addiction. Addition. We'll talk about addiction later. That was uh, based around... Perhaps this would be my last show, not because I was retiring the show by any means, but because I could possibly die from coronavirus. I'm not sure if I had it. I'm not sure if I was exposed to it. And I'm not sure if, um, you know, I'm even okay right now or currently have it. And that's always scary. Because the last episode was recorded in South Florida during a very transitional and educational time for me. But um, since then, I have moved to the beautiful and very strange and very tragic city of Los Angeles, California, the land where all the dreams come true. Today, we are sponsored by the new album from Mr. Pope, released on Autumn Sounds. It's actually an EP, but some people don't really know the difference or even tend to care or, or really tend to... Uh, pay any pay any attention it's uh dream reality which is uh inspired by the isolation the lockdown but it's uh, a very different album uh we'll play some of the songs later in the broadcast and uh, we are also brought to you tonight live literally on facebook live i'm currently streaming this and looking at the screen and getting more of the actual podcast experience live uh, it feels like millions of people are watching, though there are only two, and this is going to be broadcast on the YouTube channel that is Mr. Pope, the Mr. Pope with the green avatar, the one of the people's love cult, very distinct. Only those who love his work know of him. This is me. And I'm already getting sick of explaining that. Uh, but I want to touch on a few things. Yes, um, I probably did not plan on doing another episode of this podcast. I did not plan on going forward with it. It was just not the medium that I felt I was comfortable with. Uh, obviously, I've been doing music for a very long time, and uh, I've been uh, humbled, and uh, I've been burned through the ringer. Whether it was playing in bands in Nashville, Tennessee, playing in the punk scene in New Brunswick, New Jersey, or... Uh, my wonderful hometown of South Florida. And when I say hometown, I mean Palm Beach County, West Palm Beach, the 561, which I miss very much some of the time. I think that the place I'm at now is I've got to prioritize what I really want to do and what I really want to be. But that's not always easy. Um, I also in this broadcast on this day, January 4th, 2021, I am reluctant and yet proud to tell you all that I am uh, one day shy of a month sober. One of the reasons why I was not doing this show was because I could not do this show. I could not record myself. I could not get in that creative zone unless I was drunk. I uh, started this show on Instagram Live. I uh, would just kind of rant and ramble on and continue to drink. And then I continued doing that 
the very first episode of the podcast was with a couple of friends of mine drinking. And um, it was, uh, to me, uh, I guess you could call it a trigger. Um, it was really strange to uh, go and move during a time like this, during a very, uh, you know, a time when you really shouldn't just move from one populated area, especially an area like South Florida, where, you know, it's just people are uh, condemning it as an invisible entity, as something that is not a threat, though the numbers go up. Now, we won't really get into the length and the details of all that. I've uh, mentioned in the previous episode my feelings about the state we're in. And uh, that's an important thing that I can't stress enough, that uh, we are all kind of just, in a way, exhausted and have spent going on about a year of complete panic. So 2021 is here. Uh, we got the bastard out of the office, but, uh, you know, meet the new boss, probably same as the old boss. Definitely not the same kind of boss, but I don't want to get the political thing, that spectrum, that's really... Uh, I've, I've dabbled in it before uh, during my heavy periods of drinking and I just am not in a place to go there because I'm sick and I'm hurting. I, uh, I've recently moved once again uh, to Los Angeles and I live in a, a very strange artist residency where I am gifted and privileged the uh, resources of a studio, uh, there's a, a, a projector and in the attic, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, coyotes uh, that I guess I could call pets. I uh, have seen a few coyotes, but uh, no, let's uh, switch to serious here. Um, I uh, was drinking very heavily and there are a lot of people who have come through this area meaning this home, this artist residency that I live in. And I realize that you can basically be whatever you want to be when you're from somewhere else. You can be a complete fraud and a complete imposter. And that's what I realized I, I was. I, I came here to this city almost as if I was owed something. And, um, I've had to really hold myself accountable. I felt that maybe this was a platform, this was a medium that not only I couldn't do sober, but it was also something that I uh, couldn't stress enough was just bad for me, it was just toxic, because then anyone who knows me would know that my biggest problem is my fucking attitude and my mouth. I will just go off, I'll say whatever the fuck I want, and I will not be remorseful whatsoever. I will just completely burn bridges and disregard people's feelings in favor for my own. And, uh, you know, nobody, nobody, that's not enjoyable. That's not a pleasant person. It's actually a, the worst kind of person to be, believe it or not, for the people who care about you. And uh, even so recently as today, I have concerned and alarmed the people I love the most. I recently read uh, an article about Shia LaBeouf, who, uh, funny enough, I, I was actually kind of jealous of because I've, I've been with a lot of, not a lot, but I've been with some girls, hung out with some girls who, who really liked uh, Shia LaBeouf. And, um, you know, me being the pretentious asshole I am, only just uh, shouted, uh, you know, envy and, and, oh, well, he's a, he's a bullshitter, you know, and, and really, honestly, my opinion, let's talk about that for a minute. Shia LaBeouf, what do I think of Shia LaBeouf's art? God damn. You know, I, I watched that movie Honey Boy recently, and I think he did a pretty good job, but it was almost like watching, like, just, you know, a, a guy uh, do an accent of his, you know, of his father, like, do an impression of him that he's like really trying to get spot on like every, every mannerism of. And I think it, I thought it was a decent movie and I actually have a a newfound, I guess, empathy towards him. But I mean, you know, his behavior is inexcusable and it's deplorable. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I 
have been deplorable. Fucked myself so deeply and sank so low. Even recently, without the lubricant of alcohol. When I was in South Florida, thank God for coronavirus, to be honest with you. Thank God that I am not at a bar right now trying to impress a woman I don't know. And I just want to talk a little further about that. I uh, struggle with being single. And I struggle with the image I have of myself. That's where that fraud and that imposter, that's where Mr. Pope really begins. I was recording albums with uh, the People's Love Cult up until I left Florida, but to be honest with you, the last three People's Love Cult albums, for those of you who do not know, that is my band. That's not just a slogan I put on. That is something that I have, that I worked very hard to develop since 2014. But it was my band. And I worked with a lot of great people who I still love and respect. And uh, if they hear this broadcast, this whole thing, if you were part of the band, I love you. And I'm sorry. I wanted it to be my band. I wanted it to be my, I wanted to be the, the narrator, the producer, the auteur, the artist. I wanted to be the brains, the looks, the wit. And you just can't be everything in a band. A band is about teamwork. A band is about collaboration, which is where I will announce the, well, I will never say that the People's Love Cult will come to an end because the dream is this. It's a band that is like a religion. It's fundamental. It's embedded in tradition. And it's about fun. That The last part just has nothing to do with religion. But it is about being yourself. And when I... I've always struggled to just be in a band and... Uh, I'm clearly difficult to work with. Um, really not the easiest person to love in that sense. I am not the easiest person to be around. I do have a very poor image of myself, but there's a time and place when I get over that. And uh, let's talk about that for a minute. The way that you view yourself is always subjective. There's this whole illusion that we have today that loving yourself is going to automatically make the world around you love you. I feel like this is the biggest cop-out in the book. I'm very sorry if you believe this, if you're one of the people who listen to this show, if you're one of the people who's familiar with me. I think that's a load of bullshit. Because I guess I have less faith in humanity than to really think that it just takes becoming a vain fucking narcissist and a complete egomaniac in order to find somebody. But it's like, what kind of love are you looking for? I mean, what, you know, there's so many things that I struggle with. I, I, I will not stress and I will not back down because I can't have some paragraph in the form of a Facebook comment or in the form of a goddamn uh, a link to something that, like, people have sent me things, you know, like, like things that are, are, are bullshit to me. And I, you don't want to be the cynical asshole when you're reading these things, but goddamn, can't you say something nice about me? Can't it just so, like, you know, being single, can't a, a woman just be like, hey, you look good. You know, that's, that's just, you know, a very embarrassing part of me. It has been a very long time that I have been single, uh, which I have, you know, kind of really through my both my reputation and in my antics, at this point not even drinking, I've dug myself a very deep grave, 
And um, it's not fun for me anymore. It's not fun to project what I was doing as uh, Mr. Pope, what I've done as uh, the person who's survived, but also cut ties and scorned himself. It's not fun to be this person anymore. So I'm going to take the advice that I, I can't fathom. I'm going to love myself. I'm going to find something within myself that I actually appreciate. Because I've lost someone so dear to me, and so close to me. I've lost so many people because of this. I have not been the man I need to be. And I put too much faith in this being a man thing. I don't think there is any there's really any easy answer or easy way to move on. I, I fall in love so easily. And I have a whole project that became this, this a whole album, a whole book of songs that I was writing since I've been here that has just hit me like a blunt force fucking injury. And it's not fun for me to, it's, I'm a very deprecating person, I'm very neurotic, but at this point, it hasn't gotten me anywhere. It hasn't fulfilled me in any way. Maybe it's made some people laugh. You know, some people who, who uh, share their opinions or have a, a very poor image of themselves like I do. Maybe it's kind of been an aid. I mean, we live in, as I call it, the ha-ha generation. We live with the, the he-he's, the ha-ha's, and the ho-ho's. We have to fucking laugh about everything. They made a meme out of me. Now I got no self-esteem. I love when people crush my dreams. You know, it's just, that's the sing song. And if, and, and, and it's, it's so, it's so bad when you think, why don't we just get away from this? Have you ever seen, I, I'm pretty sure I said this on the last episode, which you guys can check out. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're listening, watching this, if you're listening to this on YouTube, but it's like, have you ever seen something that is not funny? Have you ever related to something? Have you ever watched a movie and seen a character and been like, oh my God, I'm afraid. That's me. You've seen maybe a, a, a film where there's the asshole possessive boyfriend and you see the moment that he finally gets his validation and I really wish I, I really wish I had a more of a feminine presence in my life. I guess I, I'm th the feminine presence in my life for most of it. But when you see something that is memeable, that is totally fucked up, and it, it just reeks of you. What you know, it, it, it reeks of you. You're just waiting for that show to end. And that prevents you from working on yourself. I just really have to rant a little bit here. You know, I, I came to this city not wanting to fall in love with anything but the work I was doing. And then things got slower. I myself forgot we were in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, online dating, app dating, it it doesn't necessarily work for me. I don't think it works in general. I'm not one of those people who really believes in it. But my other solution was getting drunk at a bar. I don't know how to meet people. I don't, I don't really know anybody here in this town. But here I go again. You know, my priorities are all fucked up. And I have made it impossible despite any good qualities that I may have, despite any 
people who call me talented and brilliant and you know at times my favorite is hearing the term beautiful person but I get so sick of not feeling like one there's always the dead air there for me there's always the silence there's always the solitude there's always those moments when these feelings pass I just wake up I get coffee I drink too much coffee later on in the day but it's when I get up it's in the morning it's the first hour I never want that taken away from me and every day I watch the mountains grow closer I see the canyons but I also see the debauchery and I see the things that so many uh, other insane people have dreamt of and described and captured in their work and it reminds me a lot of my home of South Florida and it reminds me that there was such a strange beauty there and yet I was so much more alone during the beginning of this period that it was honestly sad enough to say some of the best times of my life was partying like a fucking insomniac I just would stay up all night and I was sober too I, I didn't drink during the pandemic out of respect for you know well when I was living with my family you know I, it, it was a slump it was moving back home and it's still possible you know and I, I just I have always been terrible with the schedule I'm too damn entitled I'm too damn self-involved to actually do anything for myself that isn't the same shitty toxic vicious cycle that um, leads me to once again hate myself and I really felt like I was owed something in fact I knew how big of a troll it was how much of a farce that really was was what if I was the person who went around as if the world owed me and actually saying it and not denying it and that being my thing but there's just a point when you become so like disgusted with who you are with with where you're going and you could have a wonderful thing you can have a wonderful thing that you can actually appreciate for what it is but then you want more because you feel inclined and that you're owed it you should never feel that you're owed everything you can feel like you deserve better but you can't feel like you're owed everything it really is a self-fulfilling pile of shit and the whole the, the whole um, complex I have now is I really do look at myself and I say what the fuck what what is wrong with me what what is it about me it's it's got to be something that everybody sees when I walk in the damn room I wish that there could be a reality where I was just everything I wanted to be and more and, and amazed by what people the impression people got from me you know I've been called a piece of work I want to be called a piece of artwork I mean even I mean this this corniness this these these very faux pas things again this is another symptom of mental illness and uh, projecting <clears throat> I have recently taken a unintentional hiatus from making music because without the alcohol I feel like I can't write I feel like I can't create I don't feel like I can actually be the best version of myself I don't feel like I can tap into that it's too early on but I have been mixing what happened to me in the process of trying to get away from so-called lo-fi music and 
I believe I did it okay on my uh, album Hard Sell. I mean, it's always a tragic joke for me, even the title of that album. But when I was doing that and doing that, I um, was trying to get away from the songwriting, what I felt like had kind of left me. I don't know what the future is going to look like with my art, with my music. I don't have an idea of it yet because I honestly am just so focused on survival, on what the next job will be. But the way that I'm viewing this is job the job because anything you're capable of doing Yes, even if it is something creative. I don't even like using that word creative. I feel like that's a term that people say when they are too humbled or annoyed to say artist, art, whatever. It's time during this change we've had in our reality to all become self-employed and view our work, our art as a trade, provide a service. If you're in South Florida, if you're in Alabama, if you're in Colorado, if you're anywhere, if you're in a small town or a big, if you're in a big city and there's competition, don't believe in competition. If you are in a small town, be a big fish in a small pond. I have never, despite all the travels I've done, all the different places I've lived, I have never felt like I belonged anywhere. I never felt like I was really a part of something. Because I, for some reason, had this unreliable ego, this self-deprecating person who coped with his own failure and his own past through egomania, an ego-tripping binge. And it almost feels like its own high, it's its own adrenaline rush, um, which is what I sang about in my first real uh, serious album, I had an album before that too. The first one was kind of a compilation. The second one was called Ama Savant, spelled I-M-M-A. But then there was The Mania. The Mania was an album that I did during a period I was a very bad heroin addict. And um, it was during a time when I really felt that I needed to be the mess I was and that that mess would reach people and touch people in a certain way. I fell in love too deeply with the idea that the struggle was necessary, but I heard something the other day that was beautiful. I was listening to one of my original heroes, David Lynch, talk about creativity and the creative process. And I felt like I was there in the Hollywood Hills, right there next to him, as if he was giving me fatherly advice. And he told me, you need clarity in order to create. You need clarity in order to create. Negativity is mind control. Even when you channel your negativity, it compromises your art, it compromises your work. It compromises... It compromises the apology you're going to make towards yourself and even to others when you're trying to just be understood. I was so caught up in this being misunderstood thing being a part of me. And I had to really understand that this was not what I wanted, that there was a, a, a better way to work. And if I was really serious, if I was really professional, I wouldn't need to resort to bullshit. Now there's always, there's always weird things about people. There's always, uh, there's always just, we all have a thing. We all have, a, we, we all have uh, our, our chip on our shoulder. 
especially if you are one of these people who listen to podcasts to get to sleep because like me you have a overactive mind I mean this is probably as meta as it gets watching myself right now on Facebook live listening to myself recording myself and of course talking about myself but I need this right now I owed this to myself one thing that I am owed and that I do deserve is to listen to my own voice again and to tell myself find that clarity look for the silver lining I have been to be honest with you suicidal recently and I am doing this because I don't want to get into that dark place I don't want to have to hold back and I don't want my smile that I do give to people because I'm around people all the time I'm in a position I'm in a place where I cannot not be seen but I can escape still but I want to escape because I'm finding that light and that's uh, one of the reasons why I called the last People's Love Cold album, which might be the last for a very long time, I'm not sure. Because I'm in a place where I don't know if I want to really be in a band anymore. I don't think I'm actually mentally stable. As I mentioned, being in a band is about collaboration, and I have to tell you, I have to be the one to say that I don't think that I am really suited. I am not healthy enough to be working with people. I'm not really in a place mentally where I can... I mean, sure, I can, I can work from here, I can work remotely, I want to continue doing that. I love that. But I'm honestly not in a place where I can be okay. I put genuine effort wholeheartedly into what I do like I used to. I feel like this really is the uh, quarter life crisis for me. And um, when you uh, do quit drinking, if you do get sober, there still is going to be problems in your life and you're going to have to approach them. You're going to have to look at them and look at yourself in a whole new light. There is an overwhelming indifference that surrounds us. But I do genuinely feel that since I have stopped drinking, my consciousness has expanded. Since I have quit drinking, my consciousness has expanded. But my anxiety and my paranoia and my fear, it has really, really, really been through the roof. What I can realize now is that I don't have the crutch of the addiction, but I still have the addiction. I have the mentality. This is the first time I'll tell you all, those of you who are familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, that yes, I do have the disease. There is an emptiness in front of me. I've been to rehab. I've been sent to so many different treatment centers. I've been to rehab about seven or eight times, but it was during this time that I quit drinking. Tomorrow will be a month, December 5th, 2020. I quit drinking. For now, unfortunately, I can say, I don't know what my life is gonna be like. I don't know if I trust myself yet. But I did this out of the willingness, out of my own desire, my own want to change. It wasn't fun anymore, but I did it not being sent to rehabs. I was sent to rehab centers <clears throat> when I was, uh, you know, from, from about uh, 18 to uh, the last time I was in, I was 23 or 4. So then there were three years after that where it was complete fair game and my life was a mess. Um, that's when I had reformed the band The People's Love Cold. That was when I was recording albums on my cell phone and taking them and teaching myself how to engineer and produce my own music. I would stay up all night and uh, sometimes I was out of my fucking mind, but I was in such a debilitated state where all this music was all I had and uh, this music is there for everybody now it's not mine anymore I realized too that 
I have been a deplorable person. I have been irredeemable. And now I have a responsibility towards the people who have supported me and who have shown me love. I have a responsibility to my family, my friends, but most importantly, myself. Life just hits you like a blunt force injury, and so does love. I don't know what love is. I don't know. I mean, I believe in love. I feel like it is a, a yeah, a consciousness, sure. But that's in a love that I've never sought. Maybe that's in the concept of self-love that I've attempted to speak of, that I've attempted to capture throughout all this time. And I'm really just going on and rambling, but this is the only chance I have right now to escape, to, to capture something that is bigger than me. I believe there is purpose in my life. I'm going to continue to believe that there is purpose. No matter what, I am going to keep this story going. I have been recently, I will say again, feeling down on my luck and hopeless. But it's really because of the most superficial things. It's because I've been alone without, yeah, choosing to be alone. And I looked for love in all the wrong places. I don't know if that will ever, if that will ever change for me. This is God's way of showing, showing me that I, I have a lot to learn and I need to be alone. Because I don't know in my life, I, I don't, I, I hear even from the people I've fallen in love with tell me, when you're not looking, that's where it is, as they're looking at me. And then, what's wrong with me? Why? Why, God? Why? 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 And I become physically, and I become physically and uh, emotionally the ugly person that I see when I look in the mirror. And I, I hate looking in mirrors. I don't believe in looking in mirrors. I remember there was a time when I didn't believe I deserved to wear the clean shirt. Keep that shirt on. Wear it down. Wear the dirty white shirt. Keep the holes in your socks. You don't deserve this yet. You need to discipline yourself. Eat dirt to survive. Even when there's a full meal in your fridge. And I can't get out of this way of thinking. I don't know if I was brought up to believe this. I don't want to believe that. But I feel like I was raised in a scope that... I wasn't brought up to believe anything that was taught me that was taught to me. When I say that, I, I really think about my family. and I am a uh, child of divorce. I think that the fact that I was never disclosed or given the opportunity or the chance to know what divorce was, I just remember being in divorce groups, divorce uh, group therapies in, in school, being pulled from class, thinking, oh shit, nice. This is an excuse to not be in class now. This is, this is, this is, this is awesome. And then it becomes something else. I heard the word divorce. Divorce actually hasn't reg registered in my mind. I, I remember my grandparents just came to watch me. I thought my parents were on vacation. And, and then I wish I had a vivid memory of what the divorce was. Because I, I think I grew up in a slightly, well, no, a very divided and embattled environment that I was never comfortable speaking with. And for years, I, I blamed it. Well, I didn't really blame it on myself. I, I blamed something that I couldn't understand and that I'm not meant to understand. And I was pissed off because I couldn't know. That I, I didn't deserve to know. It felt like and I, I saw two realities two people's lives I was on looking I was an outsider and I was seeing from afar and I didn't know I didn't I, I couldn't understand I, I didn't want to know because I had a preference I was subjected I was biased towards 
what it meant for two people to be together. I had almost missed something that I really can't remember, which is my parents being together. And I'm not ever, ever, ever going to lose any love for both my mother and my father, the people who made me who I am, who support me. They needed a break from me. They always will and they still will, and I know they're proud of me. I mean, this is really getting into some territory that, you know, may seem like, well, he's just crying about his life, but I always felt this need to impress two very different people. And since then, I've had this very strange, skewered idea of what love is. And I've always talked down on, yeah, those spiritual people, yeah, those people who say that, you know, self-love and love is everywhere. It's, it's within yourself, find it. It's what made me get really frustrated at the lyrics of my old bandmate, Brandon. I felt like he was just full of shit. He was an idealist. He was, you know, pulling things out of his ass and he was, uh, he had no right to do it. That I was real and I was this underdog and I was a fighter and all, the, all these things. But what I wasn't, I wasn't a good listener. And I got to see the People's Love Cult, or the, the final incarnation that wasn't just me and some collaborators. I got to see the band become something that is actually a lot better than when I was there. I was never kicked out of my band, but you gotta understand that I was playing music with some people who really weren't trying to be a part of my project because of what I had said earlier, because of what I had mentioned, and what I couldn't stress enough was this whole notion that you guys are gonna follow me. I mean, I'm not paying them. I'm no, you know, I'm not like a Frank Zappa. You know, this is not like a salary job. And of course, we struggle to get shows, even at the smallest club. The one I've talked on this podcast about before. Name dropping. Showing such low character and low class, it's like, get over it. Of course nobody wanted to fucking book me. Of course. It didn't matter how many albums we had out, how prolific we were, they were being led by an alcoholic, heroin addict, fucking crazy, fucking just degenerate scoundrel. And then I started to revel in that. I looked at people like Orson Welles. I looked at people like, yeah, um, the very obvious influence of the band, Anton Newcomb, the Brian Jonestown Massacre. I looked at that stuff and I didn't want to necessarily imitate and be like the Vincent Gallo, the spiteful, whatever. But I totally was, you know, it was it was giving me validation. It gave me validation to to see some really difficult people, like how Miles Davis uh, studying Hurricane Carter, being difficult just for the sake of being difficult. Well, now it's difficult for me, Mr. Pope. I'll tell you, it's difficult for me, and I'm not Mr. Pope. My name is Nick. My name is Nicholas Rodenko Stefanovich, as a matter of fact. And I hear the term Nick, I hear the, the word Nick, that's my name. And I wanted to be something more because I hated myself. And it was just strange because nobody really seemed to get it. But now I'm, I'm in a position where I have to destroy the first band that's also religion. I have to burn the books of these songs. I will never delete my albums, I will never burn my actual books of songs, but what I will do is move on. There is no band right now. There is no Mr. Pope. The curse of Mr. Pope is that Mr. Pope is the curse of Mr. Pope. That is another new EP. We'll play some songs from that one, in addition to some new material that I'm not sure when it will be released. but. They're on YouTube. I uh, am very much enjoying Los Angeles overall. And uh, I really want to enjoy and be capable of having a healing process when this is over.
But this coronavirus is COVID. It really, I mean, social distancing, that was the last thing I ever wanted. And I know that some of you feel the same way. But the real test is this. I had a phrase when I was a bad friend and a uh, mooching drunk, conniving person. I would, uh, you know, just be very difficult on purpose, strategically difficult. And uh, that was because I was growing hungry and tired and not wanting to leave, not having the strength to just walk away. So I would say to my friends, when I would do something bad, when I would be a piece of shit, and they would ask why, my only answer was, whatever it takes to be alone again. And I uh, succeeded. I, uh, I've been a very toxic person. There have been toxic people around me. There have been very toxic times. And um, I definitely did not make it any better for myself. But I had to be wrong in order to learn. My new mantra. I had to be wrong in order to learn. My least favorite song, new song, that I've recorded is one that sounds of quality, and it's called This Spirit. And it's about losing your spirituality. Because I feel like at this point that I'm at, even though I feel like my consciousness has expanded in that way, naturally, my awareness has shifted and I've changed. I feel like I have lost my spirituality. And I don't know if there's a God, but I want there to be. This has been the brand new episode of Let's Talk About That for a Minute. I'm your host, Mr. Pope. Thank you so much, those of you that tuned in on the Facebook live stream. We will take the rest of this show to listen to some new music. And follow me on Instagram, channel underscore Seth, on Twitter, channel underscore Seth. Channel Seth is another project of mine. We can talk about that maybe the next episode. We can talk about it. Feel free to email me, stefanoviknick, N-I-K, at gmail.com. Find me on Facebook, Mr. Pope. Find the Sun God Records YouTube page that's on YouTube. And maybe when you get a chance, because I do suffer from a condition known as shameless self-promotion, take a look at what I'm doing. It's really just because I have something that I want to share with you. That's not just podcasting and ranting and raving. I really am proud of what I do. And I... I'm here announcing my hiatus from music as Mr. Pope or whatever, my solo records to focus on other things. I don't know what I'm going to do now. I just feel like I'm going to well, I don't know. See, I don't know yet. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I want to I, I want to live. I want to love. I want to be. I want to be in a, a good place. I don't want to be suicidal like I am right now. I don't want to be doubting myself and and in this in this prison. I, I want to. I want to feel something that's not scorned for myself. That was giving me so much. It felt like, and was doing so much more damage to me, and making me such a basket case. And I, I just. I want to look in the mirror and love who I am. I, I don't want to hear any, I, I don't want to be given any false sense of hope. I want this hope to be real. Because you know my love is real. Those of you that have paid any attention to me, the fact that I, I can be more than just a memory or something that wasn't was or what could have been, there's a reason why I'm still here. Earlier today I I lost something. 
and I, I want I want to find it again. And I, I don't know if I even understood what I actually lost. But it's a breaking point for me. There's this fear of betrayal, uh, this fear of betrayal that I have. That's uh, it's a it's a, a product of something music can't even heal for me. It's just a a jarring, hindering dream. And I, I want to really. There's so many things I could say. There's so many ways I could put this. But I do feel like I need to take a step back. Maybe I've said this before on previous podcasts, on previous episodes. I need to take a step back and allow myself just the time to heal. And uh, time will tell. But I want to keep the story going, like I said. And uh, I hope you'll be there.
you look so fine
My palate's cracking and I'm feeling unfed All of my memories are of those who are dead So please send me the girls The centuries privileged girls
wall Gotta stay away from you I've got my heart on the rocks and it's slipping away Oh, but please await me before I slip away Try to disappear It's my fault Staying here with you Hot on the
That's all I got.
Live from the Sun God Records headquarters, WCCA KX1U. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is music producer Mr. Pope. And tonight we have a special, very special presentation for you all. Hailing all the way down south from the Dixieland. Two renegade artists you probably haven't heard of or even cared enough to know. Ladies and gentlemen, the Jazz Twins. Hey man, you tell me one thing. How did, how did it take this long for us to land us a gig? We've been together for about maybe four to five months.